Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who owns a whole heck of a lot of oceanfront property in Arizona. He is the permanent vacation captain. Your mom's on vacation. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very pleased to be featuring Shook from the brilliant minds over at Black Hog Brewing Company. Shook is an India pale ale that really is smoothed out quite a bit with citrus and coconut. I don't even like coconut, but I love this beer. ABV 5.5% garage grade, 5 out of 5 bottle caps. And today we are sharing a couple of beers thanks to these good folks right here. First up, a cheers to Brenda Sue all the way out in Highland, California. And a big cheers mates to Lawson in Winter Park, Florida. And here's a big I hope I say your city right to Jesse and to a Latin, Oregon. And a shout out to Victoria in the great state of Texas. Next we have a double cheers to Krista and John up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. We also have Ava in Parts Unknown, Madeline in Parts Unknown, and a big, 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 big thank you to Portia in Parts Unknown. Yeah, and everybody living in Parts Unknown, the HOA fees are due, so pay up, you bastards. Or get out. (laughs) Or get out. For everything true crime, check out truecrimegarage.com and sign up on the mailing list so you get discounts on the store. That's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Morgan Chantel Nick was born on September 12, 1988. When she disappeared on Friday, June 9, 1995, she was six years old, four feet tall, 55 pounds, with blue eyes and long blonde hair. She had a protruding purple vein on the lower left of her rib cage and five visible silver caps on her molars that were scheduled to be removed later. The Amber Alert in Arkansas is named after Morgan Nick. An AY Magazine article by Janie Jones titled The Morgan Nick Story states, An old superstition says if you make a wish when you see the first lightning bug of the year, the wish will come true. But for Colleen Nick, lightning bugs remind her of the night her six-year-old daughter Morgan went missing. And Colleen Nick had this to say in an interview back in 1997. Ms. Nick said she still has hope Morgan will be found alive. Quote, You can't give up until you know for sure. I don't want to have to look my daughter in the eye and tell her I gave up. She goes on to say, quote, I don't know who these people are that think they can do this to our children. On the day in question, six-year-old Morgan Nick was with her mom, Colleen. The two drove from their home in Ozark, Arkansas, 30 miles away to Alma, Arkansas. Alma is a tiny town. Population was under 4,000 back in 1995. The town is nestled in the Ozark Mountains. This is a rural area, but Alma is bisected by a major highway. This is Interstate 80, and Alma is only 13 miles from the Oklahoma border. Morgan and Colleen traveled to a ballpark to watch some Little League baseball games with friends who lived in Alma. They were meeting their friends there. It was a long day of baseball, with the final game between the Pythons and the Marlins starting later than scheduled and stretching into the 10 p.m. time frame. They estimate that there was about 300 people watching the baseball game. The crowd was involved, active, and at times loud. 
Morgan was wearing a green Girl Scouts t-shirt, blue denim shorts, and white sneakers. Morgan stayed close to her mother, hanging out with her on the bleachers. The little girl enjoyed silly pranks, and that night she was trying to trick her mother by climbing down by Colleen's feet and tying her shoelaces together. Sometime around 10.30 p.m., according to Colleen, Morgan was asked by some other kids to come and catch fireflies with them. Apparently, it was common for the kids hanging out during the games to play on a hill with grassy areas and a sand pile. This is adjacent to the parking lot. Morgan was shy, and at first she did not want to go, but then decided to ask her mom if she could join the other kids. Yeah, I saw it reported that the mom at first said, no, I don't want you playing away from us. But one of the other mothers said, hey, it's common for the kids to go play over there. Yeah, the tricky thing here is the time involved. It's awfully late at night. It's going to be dark out. The, yes, it was the common play area right. for the ballpark. And these two kids, from my understanding, they already knew Morgan. It wasn't like they were new to Morgan. Right. So this was a boy named Ty. He is 10 years old and an eight-year-old girl named Jessica. So I think it also helps when granting permission to go off and play in a different area that these two children are a little older than your six-year-old daughter. Yeah, and I don't think this other mother was out of line to say, hey, kids play there all the time, but baseball games are not played there all the time that late. So this area is fairly well lit, and Colleen said that she could see Morgan and the other kids running around from where she sat in the bleachers. Now, she does admit that she occasionally lost sight of her daughter. This play area was approximately 75 yards from where Colleen was sitting. But then the game ended. Now it's right around 10.45 p.m. So not too much time has passed between granting permission to go off and play and the end of this game. At the time, Ty and Jessica, the two other children, ran back up to the bleachers. But as Colleen quickly noticed, Morgan was not with them. When she asked the youngsters about Morgan, they said they last saw Morgan sitting in the parking lot. She was emptying out her shoes according to the kids emptying out sand from her shoes. And after that, the two kids lost track of their little friend. Colleen is now on high alert, and she starts racing toward the parking lot. Given the situation the two kids just described, Colleen assumed that Morgan would meet her at the car. This is a Nissan Stanza. But when she got there to her car, there was no sign of Morgan. She looked for her in the area, asking everyone if they had seen her, but they had not. The ballpark was clearing out, and there was no sign of Morgan. Colleen got the other parents and even some of the baseball coaches involved in this search. Someone with a cell phone offered the phone to Colleen, and she called the police. Authorities were very quick to respond, arriving within six minutes of Colleen's frantic call. Once on the scene, the two little kids that were playing with Morgan, Ty and Jessica, told authorities that while they were playing, a man that the two described simply as creepy. Mm -hmm. This man came up to the three children and spoke to them. Well, interesting since it's 1995 that somebody had a cell phone. So that's lucky for them and good for the police to respond as quickly as they did. Do we have a report of what El Creepo said to these kids? We do and we don't. And I think we can dive into that more later when we're looking at the details of this possible suspect. But I think what we should talk about here is why he immediately becomes a suspect. Mm -hmm. So from the general understanding that we have in this situation, we have about 300 people at this ballpark and yes, it's loud at times. It's busy. There's a lot going on. These games are stretching far into the night, much later than expected. Right. This man, according to these two children, spoke with Morgan. Remember this this time frame, this window of time when this little girl goes missing. It's about 15 minutes. Pretty short, right? Yeah. This guy, during that time frame, speaks to this little girl and the two others. Right. Now, the reason why we don't have a 100% confirmation about what he said to the children is because police stated early on, this guy's a suspect. And we are holding back the information of what was said to the children by this man. Right. 
because we need something to weed out any possible false confessions or false confessors that may come forward. Right. He becomes an immediate suspect because during the short window, he interacts with the three children, one of them who went missing, and apparently, once it is known that Morgan is missing, has disappeared, this man is gone too. Nobody remembers seeing him or his vehicle after they noticed that Morgan was missing. Right, and I, I think a lot of people would assume that this guy is El Creepo is driving around in an El Creepo van, but but he wasn't. So this man is described as having a short or clipped beard. Some reports state that it was a half an inch thick. He's estimated to be about 23 to 38 years old, about six feet tall, 180 pounds, slicked back dark hair, wearing denim cutoff shorts, no shirt or shoes with a hairy chest. All right. So he has a hairy chest and he's wearing jorts. He spoke to the kids in what they referred to as a hillbilly accent. So I'm just assuming that these other two kids are possibly not from around there because I think this would be kind of a standard local accent because it is Arkansas. The two children were from Alma from the from that area or okay. lived in that area. Who knows where they, they could have been born in Alaska for all I know. Right. So maybe, but so maybe it wasn't common in, in their local area. Yeah. The, the interesting thing here too, captain is that the two children were not the only ones to see this, what we will refer to as quote, the creepy man. One female adult witness reported seeing the man as well. She apparently also verified the description of the man. She saw speaking to the t- the kids. Right. She says she only saw him from afar, but the important thing is she is providing authorities with a very similar description of this man. Later, this woman was actually hypnotized by authorities in Little Rock to see if she could provide any more information. Unfortunately, she could not. Now, we will continue to revisit this creepy man that was spotted talking to the children, yeah. Morgan being one of them. We will revisit him as he is the crux of our case of her disappearance. Other than the three persons we have already discussed, the two children playing with Morgan and an unnamed woman, no one else seems to have remarked about this to investigators. And Morgan's mother never saw this creepy guy. Correct. Now, nobody else coming forward. This could be for any number of reasons. It could be that this is a small town. This man is known to locals and not seen as a threat and is really just a red herring. Or he could be someone who had a legitimate reason to be there that night. So he didn't trigger any alarm bells. Or it could just be that no one other than our three witnesses noticed this man at all. Right. The creepy man that we have discussed is considered a suspect not just because he was seen talking with these three children, but also because he was seen by the woman when Morgan is there and accounted for. Then just a short time later, Morgan is gone, and apparently this man seems to be gone as well. Well, and at some point, Morgan's mom also saw her playing, so we have a window of 15 minutes. Now we have a oh, eyewitness seeing the creepy man. We also have probably other sightings from Morgan's mother seeing Morgan play. Mm -hmm. So you could narrow down this window to probably within a couple minutes of when she was actually taken. A sketch of the man was circulated and a description of a vehicle that the creepy man may have been driving was also circulated shortly after the abduction. The Charlie Project website states based on reporting at the time that witnesses at the ball game said the unidentified man may have been seen near a red Ford pickup truck with a white camper, which was about five inches too small for the truck bed. The camper's windows were covered with curtains. The truck had a dull paint job because it was clearly old, likely vintage. They estimate between 1968 and 1974 and had a short wheelbase and was possibly damaged on its right rear end. Reports that it had Arkansas plates also circulated. Now, it breaks my heart to report that Morgan, she has never been seen or heard from since. There are some really important aspects to this abduction that are key and unfortunately not very helpful to investigators. No one saw Morgan leave the ballpark at all. 
No one saw this little girl leave the ballpark alone or with anyone else. She simply was there, and then she wasn't. Well, right, and nobody saw her leaving because she was in the camper in the back of that truck. It is usually reported in connection with this case that there were other attempted abductions around this same time. Now, one in particular reported was that earlier that same day in a laundromat in Alma, there was a bearded man trying to pull a nine-year-old girl out of the laundromat and into his truck. Somebody stepped in, intervened, and this abduction was stopped. Red truck. Uh, it says his truck. Oh. I don't have a description of the truck itself. Right. Also on the day Morgan was abducted, June 9th, 1995, there was another attempted abduction. This was reported two from earlier in the day. This is in regards to a four-year-old in Alma. The attempted abduction stopped when the girl screamed and was saved by her mother. The suspect, it's been reported, resembled Nick's abductor. The next day, June 10th, an attempted abduction of a nine-year-old girl is reported in Fort Smith. Fort Smith is just about 15 miles away. The girl reported a suspect resembling Nick's abductor tried to get her to go into the men's restroom with him, but she resisted. I do want to throw out a little caveat to everybody listening out there. Those three attempted abductions, those are legitimate reports that we found. I have some suspicions that there were actually only two, right? and that one of the, the stories of an attempted abduction has kind of changed or, you know, been molded throughout the years. So it sounds like it's a second report, but there are two legitimate, at least two of these are absolute legitimate. The third possibly as well. It's just important to point out here that we have at least two situations where somebody stating somebody that looks like this same guy, right? Possibly could have tried to abduct a young girl just within 24 hours of Morgan Nick going missing. And we'll put the composite drawing on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff at True Crime Garage. Just a couple weeks later, this is on June 26th, a gardener claimed he saw Morgan. This is Albert Harvey. He's a gardener for state representative Wanda Northcutt. He told police Saturday morning that while clearing brush from behind Mrs. Northcutt's home, he saw a man trying to get into his truck. He said the man had a blonde-headed girl with him. And when the man realized Harvey had seen him, the man grabbed the child's wrist and fled into a nearby thicket. He claimed the man matched the description of Morgan Nick's alleged abductor. Right. Police concentrated their search on an area around Mrs. Northcutt's home. Searchers combed the area on foot, horseback, and four-wheeled vehicles. They used police dogs and a helicopter. This article goes on to say the nationwide search for Morgan has produced hundreds of leads, but nothing concrete. A widely distributed composite sketch of the suspect shows a white man with salt and pepper hair and a short beard, driving a faded red Ford pickup with an ill-fitting white camper shell. Police find nothing during this search, not even a clue or a lead. Then Albert Harvey took a polygraph. Afterward, he said he made the story up. He apologized and had no explanation for Morgan's family. Yeah, that's that's so stupid. Again, that's why we point out that they hold things back to to weed out the the crazies, the false confessors that come forward. This man just wanted to be a part of the story. Right. And he offers a false lead to police. The aggravating thing here for the victims and for the families is that Police efforts are concentrated on this man's bogus story. Well, yeah, the time and the effort they spent searching. I mean, you're, you're a lying shit princess. This is less than three weeks after the abduction. This is, this is crucial time here being wasted it's, on a yeah, bogus story. Right. It's very crucial. And also, if his story is correct, it, it's telling us something. It's telling us that this perpetrator kidnapped this girl and that she's still alive. And, and that there's, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's false hope for it, the right. investigation and that the girl is still alive. The 4th of July Baxter Bulletin newspaper ran a story about the TV show America's Most Wanted. 
which ran a segment on Morgan's case just July 4th of that year, right? which produced a lot of tips, some coming from other states, Texas, Washington, and Alabama. Any leads that police were calling hot were run down, and nothing came of the tips and the information provided by tipsters. Then on July 7th, 1995, less than a month after Morgan was abducted, a Baxter Bulletin headline read, Girls Report Kidnap Attempt, Third Such Incident During Last 10 Days. The article goes on to tell this was a possible abduction attempt in late June in Cotter and one last week. So that would be late June or early July. This took place in Mountain Home. Right. The article does not describe the attempts, just saying that the suspect in both cases resembled the composite sketch of the creepy man that was released after Morgan's abduction. The third attempt stated, it's detailed and quite alarming, taking place on July 5th and 6th when two men, one described as 20 to 30 years old, about six feet tall, Uh weighing about 170 pounds with short hair and a black beard, wearing a black shirt and black pants. Now, the other man is described as younger, possibly a teenager with blonde hair. Uh The younger man was driving an older two-tone brown car with Arkansas plates with 711 as the last three digits. The two girls were both 11 years old and said the two men tried to pick them up in a Pebble Creek subdivision. The report states that they tried to run the girls over when they refused to go with the men. The girls said they saw the men again the next day. After seeing them the second time, they told their parents and the police were notified. There was an active manhunt for these two men. However, Sheriff Benny Magnus, who would have known a good deal more than what we have here to report, stated he did not think these incidents were related to the Morgan Nick case. Well, right. And let's unpack this a little bit. We have several eyewitnesses see possible other abductions, and they state that there's a single individual, and they mentioned this truck, possibly a red or faded truck. So it wouldn't be that uncommon if the abductions were going to continue that the perpetrator would switch out his vehicle for a red truck to a faded brown vehicle. But now you have another suspect with that individual. And and I think that's where they're, they're separating the two. Well, I think that presents a lot of good questions about the description we're given of this creepy man at the ballpark. Right. How much do we really know about this guy? We don't even know if the vehicle description is describing his vehicle. Right. You know, this guy was seen on foot. We don't know if he, if he walked to the ballpark and then left on foot. And the other thing too, is we don't know if somebody was with him. We don't know if it was Mm. a different vehicle completely. Yeah. But we don't have anybody coming forward stating, Hey, that was my Ford red truck with the camper on it. We also don't have anybody coming forward saying I was the man that spoke to those children. Mm -hmm. Morgan's parents, Colleen and John set up residence in the local firehouse for six weeks after the disappearance. And eventually Colleen moved to Alma full time to keep searching for her daughter. All right, cheers, you filthy animals. Make sure you be careful. And cheers to the clean people, too. Yeah. <laughs> Not just the animals that don't have thumbs. Right, and uh, <laughs> the clean the clean humans that listen to the show. Watch out for the amateurs, and cheers, and Happy New Year's to everybody. In 1995, there were two supposed sightings of Morgan in the company of a man in South Carolina that resulted in a sketch being circulated that is available on the internet with a partial license plate. Nothing came of these two sightings that we know of. But then, on September 12, 1995, three people in a small town in central Arizona say they saw Morgan Nick, 
three people reported seeing a little girl who looked like Morgan, accompanied by a man matching the description given on the composite drawing, driving a late model Ford pickup with Arkansas plates. This is in Payson, Arizona, hundreds of miles west of where she disappeared. Police searched the town, but found nothing. Well, this is a scary suspect when you think about it. Eyewitnesses see a man at the ballpark with a truck, possibly a camper attached. This this guy, this individual could be a nomad. Yeah, and it, really with all of these stories, whether it be a sighting or another possible abduction, I really just wanted to learn more of the details of such because mm. they're really left out of these stories here and to see if we can find anything that matches up with what we do know about Morgan Nick's disappearance and abduction. Usually what I find here, Captain, is when you have that type of situation where it's actually not connected to the case at all or followed up on and it just really goes nowhere, that's why there's a lack of details because they're not really necessary to the story. So one has to wonder, is there truth in any of these other possible connections or even some of the sightings of Morgan Nick? But it does show you the grand scale of this investigation and how everybody out there was aware of this missing girl. Right. There is a story from May of 1997, and I'm not going to read the entire article because there are some details as, as far as victim's name that I don't really want to get into because, again, this is another situation that seems like it could be linked, but we don't have any evidence to 100% back that up. But I think you'll find this story strange and interesting. This comes from May of 1997 in Spyro, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. This is where police were collecting ball game videos looking for clues in a girl's abduction. Right. Okay. So, yes, this is another state away. But remember, we said earlier that Alma was only what, 13, 15 miles from the Oklahoma state border? Right. And this is a town, Spiro, Spiro, however you say it, that will come up in this Morgan Nick investigation time and time again. So that's why I find this story to be so interesting. This is a abduction, a successful abduction, not just an attempted one, like we've already discussed, of a four-year-old girl. It sounds to me, the way that this article reads... My first thought was, oh, shit, this little girl was abducted from a ballpark, mm -hmm. just like Morgan Nick. It sounds to me like her home was right across the street from a ballpark, right? and she may have been abducted just outside of the ballpark or from her home, from her property. Regardless, they were collecting, you know, mom and dad shows up with the video camera to watch their daughter or their son play sports, film everything. Well, we have an abduction that took place. If you were there, we want to see your video. We want to see what is on that video. What did you pick up in the background? Vehicles? Did you actually videotape unknowing to yourself the the abduction of this little girl? Right, or people taking pictures of their kids playing, playing games and what, what evidence is in those photographs? Yeah, and the reason why I don't want to give out the victim's name here is, again, we don't know that this is connected. It seems very interesting. Not far away. Less than two years after Morgan Nick was abducted. Right. Same type of area, maybe same type of ruse used. Fortunately, this little girl was let go. She was found hours later on the side of, a, of the road. Apparently, I don't know what took place during the course of the time that she was missing, but eventually her captor dropped her off on the side of the road miles away. Well, it's interesting, too, because a lot of the attempted abductions were coming from, were on girls around the age of 10 or 11. So the other thing here, too, that I want to point out is I can't say for certain that the, this abduction is solved or unsolved. I couldn't find any record of it after this the situation of them finding the girl and collecting evidence. Right. But we got the victim back and, and seems like she's unharmed. I'm thinking of reaching out to her to see what information she can provide. 
You never know because sometimes these things are most, let's face it, most child abductions are a, a parental issue, a custody right. battle where a parent takes the kid without the other parent knowing or allowing to happen. That could be the case here. But I find this one very interesting. Now, we do know that in Morgan Nick's situation, they did the same thing. They were looking for anybody with a video camera, with their camera, to see if they could find evidence regarding Morgan Nick's disappearance on those videotapes, right. on those pictures. The interesting thing, really, the really important thing I think that we have here, 300 people at the ballpark. Of all that stuff that was collected, we don't have any confirmation of this faded red Ford pickup truck on any of those videotapes or on anybody's pictures from that night. Which, again, I don't think... It's not impossible. I don't think that's as big of a deal. It's once you add the camper element, this is a truck with a camper attached to the bed. Yeah. The fact that that is not seen in anything is is kind of odd, but again, I don't think these these eyewitnesses were making that up. I because I think they're the devil's always in the details, and when they say the campers the camper seemed maybe five inches too short for the bed of the truck, mm-hmm. that that's detail. In October of nineteen ninety seven, the Baxter Bulletin reported that the police had confiscated some items during a September search. According to the affidavit filed in Crawford County, police searched an unnamed man's home and vehicle. The man's name was brought forward to police by another man who says he was friends with this now suspect for about 13 years. Uh The suspect talked to the informant, that's his friend or former friend, whatever you want to call him, about Morgan's abduction. After the informant told police, they set up a video surveillance operation where, again, the man made statements about Morgan's abduction, this time on videotape. Police used this videotape to secure a search warrant. During the search of the suspect's vehicle, listed as a dark blue 1988 Ford pickup, investigators found a glove and a piece of paper, both with dark red stains on them which investigators thought could possibly be blood. Right. Inside the man's home, they found a pink toothbrush and hair fibers on a roll of duct tape. When they attempted to question the man, he gave authorities his lawyer's business card, and they were unable to arrest the man or even question him. Police are unable to move on from this man until the results of the test regarding the mentioned items comes back. This would end up taking about a year for the results. And when they come back, police are unable to link any of these items to Morgan Nick. Captain, this is where things are going to get wonky. And that's the best Mm. word to describe this. I prefer things to be a little wonky. Well, in 2001. Really wonky. There you go. In 2001, Arkansas authorities circulated a new sketch, a new sketch of the suspect suspected hate, yeah. in Morgan Nick's abduction. I hate when they do this. They did that with the Delphi murders as well. Delphi, they did it in Amy Maholovic's case. We've seen this actually. This is more common than people understand yeah. it to be. Often I find that it is a much shorter duration than, what is this? We're at five, six years now. Right. Yeah, but it could be similar, like with the Delphi murders, they actually had a sketch earlier, they just didn't release it. Correct. So this is this is what we know, because that's where you really go, okay, they're making a new sketch. Maybe they're just updating the old one. No, they. if you look at the new sketch, that is not the same man that is in the first sketch. Uh-huh. That's obvious, and they have said so. They've said that is the case. Now, what they state in this in 2001 is that, Arkansas authorities circulated a new sketch, this one based on actual, actual witness statements from the ballpark. And this sketch does not really resemble the sketch initially circulated. Right. So I'm looking at the first sketch or what I think is the first sketch. Thicker beard, looks like thicker hair, thicker eyebrows. 
Um, definitely a different nose, a wider nose, and a very distinct um, square jawline. Right. And that's the original from uh, 1995. And then, and I wouldn't say anything from that original drawing looked, it doesn't look that creepy. Then you go to the new sketch and it's Creep City. Which is a wonderful place to vacation with your family. No, it's not a place that you <laughs> want to go to. You can't fly there on any airline that I know of. The bad thing is it's right by Parts Unknown. So the thing here that I find weird, too, is we don't really know why these children describe this unknown man or potential suspect as a creep. Right. We don't have any details to back up that statement. Oh, he was creepy because of A, B, and C. No, we just have their general statement of a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old saying that he was a creepy man. Yeah, but again, I think if you look at the original sketch from 95... It looks more cartoony to me. So I think seeing that, I'd go, eh, the creep bells aren't alarming. They're not going off. But in this new one, kind of looks disheveled. Kind of looks like it's it's almost like a beard that it's the guy's not trying to grow out a beard. He just hasn't shaved. Uh, maybe possibly receding hairline. Again, slicked hair, but it almost like greasy. Not because they put product in it or anything, but. It's just greasier hair. And then the eyes, to me, they look like dead eyes. But what's interesting to me, or what I want to know, is how we got from this first sketch that looks nothing like the second sketch. Yes, and that's what I really want to talk about here. But but also, we have to, on some level, re-examine all the possible abductions where people said, hey, the the guy that I saw trying to abduct this girl look just like the original sketch. Well, one phrase that, that hit me hard not too long ago, and I've repeated it a few times is, and I found this during the course of investigating some of the cases that we've looked into douche canoe is sometimes we see what we want to see, even if it's subconsciously Mm -hmm. where, when you're later asked, what did the man look like? Well, if he didn't look unlike the suspect or unlike the sketch that was released, you might say he looked like that guy rather than the true statement would be he didn't look unlike that man. Right. So you ask a very good question. How do we get from one composite to what is obviously a different man that is drawn in in and released to the public in the second composite draw. It absolutely drives me insane. So I, there's some good information on that regarding in comparison the first sketch to the second. One thing that I find interesting too, Captain, is the first sketch we have a description of what the man is wearing. He's wearing the cutoff jean shorts, no shirt. They're called jorts. No socks, no shoes. In the second composite, we get no description of what the man is wearing. Right. Originally, when panic set in in the community, when Morgan Nick was first abducted within the hours and days of the abduction, the original thought by the locals was that this had to be some outsider. This had to be some maniac, some sicko pervert passing through Uh that took Morgan. And we don't have to be afraid because he's not a local. He's not here anymore. When they released the composite, a lot of that thought and fear shifted to that it could be a local. Why? The description of the vehicle states that possibly had Arkansas plates. Right. Then on top of that, when you really start to think about it too, the description of the man, shirtless, with no shoes. Hairy chest. I, I don't know. I just don't see some guy driving from states away, shirtless and shoeless, that just pops into this ballpark all of a sudden at 10 o'clock at night, 1045 at night and sees the golden opportunity and abducts this little girl, and it works out great for him. Nobody saw the abduction. Nobody knows who he is. Okay, but hold on. Let's go back to you. You don't see a, a outsider driving to the ballpark. Go over that. Why don't you see that? What? Well, this would have been off of the highway. It's not like he just happened to happen upon the ballpark and these unattended children. And then on top of that... What I'm getting at, to me, shirtless and shoeless 
suggests that the man could be local, more so than somebody passing through. I would agree with you if there wasn't a freaking camper attached to his truck. If that is his truck. Right. Correct. You are correct, sir. And but, the other but thing. You see what I'm saying? Th- that makes more sense. If that is his truck and we have a camper, hey, I'm just, I'm, I'm relaxing because I'm at home. This is my home. This guy is a, he could be from that state if the license plate suggests so. But I almost feel like that this individual maybe went there not so much to abduct a kid, but hey, we can go park at this at this baseball field and we don't have to pay for campground. Yeah. And and now that I'm here and I'm just kind of lounging around, oh well, I am a predator and there's victims all over the place. The other thing I want to point out regarding the first information regarding our suspect that came out was let's go back to our what the Charlie Project website states. Based on reporting at the time, the witness at the ballpark game said the unidentified man may have been seen near a red Ford pickup truck with a white camper, which was about five inches too small for the truck bed. I'm with you, Captain. I like the detailed information there. Right. The camper's windows were covered with curtains. Again, I like that. Maybe he's considered creepy because you don't see these campers all the time. Maybe they just found the kids found that to be weird. Yeah, I mean, we did a big campaign last year about banning the van. Maybe it should have been banning the the creepy. I call them cowboy campers. Well, yeah, I don't want to. How about uh, ban the creepy camper? And it'll be a truck with a camper on it. Here's where I think that the description mm-hmm. gets a little wonky. Remember, we're getting wonky here. Willy wonky. The truck had a doll paint job. Because it was clearly old, likely vintage, 1968 to 1974, with a short wheelbase and was possibly damaged on its right rear end. Uh Reports that it also had Arkansas plates. I'm just pointing out here, Ty is 10 years old. The girl is 8 years old. Right. We know from the woman's statements that she said she saw this man, but from afar. We can assume two things. Either she's able to provide better detailed information because she's older, wiser, more life experiences. Mm -hmm. She's an adult. These are two small children. Mm -hmm. Or she's able to provide less detailed information because she's far away from this person. What I'm I'm trying trying to point out here is I don't think that the woman is the one that's... we, We have a statement from law enforcement saying... We like her information that she provided because it's backing up the information that the children provided us, which could be as simple as a vague description of this man. And I saw him talking to those two kids and the two kids later telling police, we only spoke to one man. And so that's their, their validation for those witness accounts. Right. I don't believe, or I have a hard time believing that this woman from afar saw this man's vehicle. Or was able to provide a detailed description to down to the, the, the make of the vehicle, potential yeah. year of the vehicle. I can get if she saw in the distance, mind you, it's dark out. Right. If she saw in the distance as a dull red, maybe orange pickup. You'd be able to see the camper. You would be able to see the camper. That's about the best description you're going to get from afar in the dark. Yeah, so yeah, what I'm yeah. getting at is this detailed description, I have to believe, comes from the two children. I don't think you have to believe that. I think it's also very possible when they interviewed the 300 and some people watching the game that somebody said, well, I didn't see this El Creepo by the creepy camper, but I, I did see the truck. And and this is what I noticed about the truck. So we, we can't 100% that's link. A po- that's a possibility, but we do have statements saying that these are the only three witnesses. Uh, right there that night the and we eyewitnesses do know that, of the man we do know that police were looking for videotapes and for photographs that would contain any of the information that the witnesses saw and couldn't find any of that i'm not questioning if the truck is there i'm not questioning that one bit what i'm stating is i i believe that the description of the vehicle 
could be coming from the children. If that's right. the case, Don't regardless, right. if it comes from the woman who's afar or the children, the description of the vehicle is too detailed to come from children or to come from a woman who, who in her own words says, I only saw the man from afar. She never says I saw his truck. She never says that I saw him up close mm-hmm. or standing by the truck. I find it weird that a 10 year old or an eight year old is saying that this is a late model vehicle with a short wheelbase. Yeah, yeah. I get that there's probably damage to the vehicle. That a child would recognize that. A child would pro- would definitely recognize Arkansas plates. The reason why I'm going through this whole tailspin here is because once you change the composite sketch of the suspect, now you change a lot of what very little we and the police know of this abduction right. or possible suspect. You asked a damn good question. Why do we even have a change in the composite sketch at all? Well, I'm sure a lot of people were thinking that, but the only evidence, the only work that I could see done on the reason why it changed came out in 2018, many years after Morgan Nick was abducted and many years after the composite itself changed. One investigative journalist, and you can find these articles on Today and FortSmith.com. Fort Smith, as many already know, is not very far from from our location in question. Right. This reporter, and some of this information is backed up by police, but not 100%, not 100% backed up, not verbatim, not word for word. Just a few of the details have been confirmed by police in a, in a statement to which they are kind of apologizing or saying that there were missteps in the investigation. Yeah. What this There's reporter steps in every investigation, the, the problem is we're, we're not calling anybody bad at their job. When you're investigating something, you are, you are following a phantom. It ain't easy to follow the moves of a phantom. When you have to piece it all together, there will yeah. be missteps. That's how you, that's how you eliminate the, the innocent people from the one guilty person. Yeah. Especially in a case like this. I mean, it's, we have, several people in the location, but very few eyewitnesses. And then we have this very, like you were saying, it's very Willy Wonky situation where you have young kids uh, as eyewitnesses. Now we have this odd vehicle, this truck with a camper. That's just odd in general. It's, it's very Willy Wonky. The description changed according to today in fortsmith.com because it was not based off of the abduction of Morgan Nick. The, the original composite sketch that was put out that contained what this man was wearing and not wearing along with the vehicle description came about from witnesses to the other attempted abductions that took place. Uh. Police at the time, having no information to go off of, they believed that they likely could be connected. And because of whatever... This, to me, also points out the lack of information provided to them from the three witnesses at the ballpark. Yeah. They're going with this because they have nothing else to go on. And what they said was, we made the composite of a man that was seen in one of the other abducting abduction attempts, showed it to our three witnesses at the ballpark, and they said, yeah, on a scale of 1 to 10, it's an 8. And so that being the only thing and only information that they went on, off of right they released it to the public it's a it's in desperation that they do this and they're doing this regardless if anybody thinks this is an error a mistake or just wrongdoing they did this in desperation because they were trying to find anything they could to lead them to this little girl and bring her home safely all right so you're saying that this whole report that he's wearing jorts and he has a hairy chest this is not coming from the eyewitnesses of the ballpark. This is coming from the, the other attempted abductions. That's what's confusing here. And that's why I question the, the vehicle description. I question the clothing right. description yeah. because we know that the man's description has changed. What we do have mm-hmm. is police later saying when, when they say, look, we had to do this and this is why. We didn't have to do anything. They, they, I mean, don't fault them. They feel guilty for it. They feel bad for it. Right, they, but they didn't have to I'm do not that. gonna fault somebody for 
for doing what they believe in the heat of the moment to be the right thing. You could easily say that these attempted abductions we believe are linked to Morgan Nick's disappearance and what that perpetrator was wearing at the time was this. So the statement that the police gave in 2018 regarding the clothing, because that's that's the next question that everybody wants to know. Well, you, you changed the composite, but now we're realizing we also have this description of a vehicle. We have description of what the suspect may or may not have been wearing. Does that change? The answer simply put was they had a hard time confirming between the three witnesses at the ballpark exactly what the man was wearing that night. So rather than make another mistake, they chose not to include it on the new composite that came out five, six years later. Well, I can understand why people would be confused when you see something that looks like jeans, but they're short, like shorts. It's confusing. Well, again, a lot of people don't see jorts. The problem the here is, is simply put what we state stated earlier. Nobody saw Morgan Nick leave the ballpark. Nobody saw her leave alone or with somebody else. Right. Or nobody heard a scream. Nobody saw a man grab a child and throw the child inside a vehicle and speed off. Right. But, but had right. that gone down, we would have a better different description from the two children and from the woman from afar. Plus we would have other eyewitnesses that would have noticed something going on. Right. When you have a situation where nobody knows that something wrong is about to happen, you lose some of those details. People are not really focusing in or honing in on certain details at the time because life most of the time is just ordinary. This was yeah. just an ordinary moment until later they realized that this girl was missing. Well, I don't think so. I think uh, I think mother's intuition, I think when her daughter was saying, when Morgan was saying, let me go play, and the mom said, no, we're not going to do that. I don't think it was so much that it was dark. She saw other kids playing. I think that was mother's intuition that something right, something's not right. And then she got reassurance from somebody else. Don't worry. They play here all the time. And then she let her out of her sights. And, and, but I think that was some, something telling her, don't, don't let your daughter go play. The other thing too, and this is just a reminder, like we've done in so many other cases, Amy Mahalovic comes to mind immediately. If you suspect someone or suspect something, in regards to someone you know, or maybe you only kind of know them, right? do not hesitate to provide that information to authorities just because anything given in either composite would cancel out your suspicion. Well, and like, like you were saying, there was a couple, there was at least one abduction where they say there was a truck, but they believe the truck was blue. If the eyewitness accounts of the truck with the, the camper Maybe it wasn't red. Maybe it was blue. Mm -hmm. And and but that's the stuff that frustrates me because somebody could be reading the newspaper, let's say in 1995, and says, "Okay, well, the, this kid was abducted. Oh, I kind of know this weirdo. He has a he has a red truck, or he has a blue truck, or whatever color truck he has. He has a brown truck with a camper, it's too small for the bed. Kind of strange, but it doesn't match." Or, or it has Texas plates or, right. you know, there's one thing that's off or a couple of things that are off and you go, well, I'm not going to call him, call it in. I don't want to disrupt his life because it can't be him because right. he's not from Arkansas or any other number of reasons. And the problem is then you learn later on years later that scratch that you really know nothing about the likely suspect. Right. In 2010, Federal investigators, this took place in um, November. Federal investigators searched a vacant trailer home in Spiro, Oklahoma for DNA evidence in the Morgan Nick case. Again, this is where we hear that town name again. They zeroed in on this trailer because they received a tip. They searched the same area again on December 18th and 19th, seven years later in 2017, and a cadaver dog alerted to a well that was found on the property, but nothing 
was found in the well. Right. But they could be alerting to some remnants of, of, of something. Yeah, there was nothing found in regards to Morgan's case. And apparently this tip was from a narcotics officer who alerted police to the abandoned home, which belonged to a convicted child molester who was in prison at the time of both of the searches. Mm -hmm. The tip technically didn't pertain specifically to Morgan's case, but because the guy was on their suspect list, they searched it. Right. And he may have just been on the suspect list because of where he was living and that he was convicted child molester. Right. I would like to know what his vehicle history was. Back to our creepy guy, Captain, mm. in the cowboy camper with the faded red truck, or who knows what he was it's driving. It's called the creepy camper. <laughs> Further, according to the 2018 investigative reporter looking into the case, this is the one that I feel put out some good information. You can call it a leak. You could call it speculation, what have you. Mm. It's thought-provoking regarding... Morgan Nick's case that I'm hoping does not dry up. This investigative reporter said that the FBI profilers that took a look at the case concluded early on that the shirtless man seen talking to the kids was not a likely suspect. Really? They thought that it would be certainly strange for someone shirtless and shoeless to abduct a child in his somewhat ragged appearance seems to indicate that he was likely a local who lived nearby. What they are kind of suggesting here, captain is maybe this individual didn't belong to that vehicle right. to that, to that truck. Right. Maybe it was somebody that lived nearby that happened to be passing through on foot or had a reason to be at the ballpark. Right. Shirtless shoeless is awfully casual. Yeah, again, I don't find it that casual if your if your house is in the back of your truck. Right, but I think what the the FBI profilers are pointing out here is a couple things. One, we don't know if this man that was seen that spoke to the children in fact took Morgan. Right. That's just the suspicion. Two, we don't know if he and the vehicle belong together. Right. Three, we don't even know if he had a vehicle there with him. Right. I want to get into some of the details of that night. One, I question immediately the time frame. 10.30 at night. Who's playing a Little League baseball game at 10.30 at night? It ends at 10.45. I, I'm not going to lie. I questioned a little Colleen allowing her six-year-old daughter to go off and play away from her that late at night. You're right, but that's but, fair but, to question because she questions it herself. Correct. So. And and I, I throw no fault at her, especially when you have locals, people that you know and trust, telling you all the kids go over there and play. Look, right. it's it's lit. We can see them from here. No big deal. Plus, the game's going to be over pretty soon. Right. I think that the where you would think that the number of people in the ballpark that evening, that night, would help you in this investigation, you know, it gives you more sets of eyes, more sets of ears. I think in this situation, it may have hurt the investigation. I wonder if we have, if we have a crowd that's active, that's loud, that's involved in the game. My understanding is it was a tournament that was going on that day. Right. And that's why they had played so late because it's probably the championship game and they're trying to get it over with. Well, not only that, my understanding is the game was supposed to, the game that they were watching mm -hmm. was supposed to start something like two and a half or three hours earlier than what it actually started. And you and I, growing up, we played in soccer tournaments. Uh, you probably played in baseball tournaments. Uh -huh. I was terrible at baseball. That's why I like to watch it. I was bad at baseball too, but I played in tournaments. So now with me, you watch. But the, regarding these tournaments and basketball tournaments, so on and so forth, we all know that if, if the first game runs long or if there's any kind of slip up in between games, it pushes everything back. And then if there's another slip up or another game goes long, it pushes everything back right. and further and further. And especially in a tournament setting where you need to win or lose to determine who moves on, you can't have a tie, these games can go extra innings. Well, and you also have people traveling from out of town. That's why I was saying that they'll push things back and, and maybe not use their best judgment. Because, I, I look, I just don't think it's safe to have that many kids and and, and those, that many unknown people in this park You know, starting a game at 
almost 10 o'clock. So I've always wondered about Morgan's case, one simple thing, that we don't have anyone that saw her snatched and grabbed and taken away. We didn't have anybody hear a scream or a yell. There's no buddy that witnessed an altercation between a little girl and creep man. Right. So you have to wonder two things. Is it possible that she went willing with this individual? It could be that she thought she knew him. She knew him. He offered money or a reason to get into the vehicle and she just went quietly and willingly. Right. Or did he actually have to grab her and abduct her and take her away? And it was just missed because all the eyes are on the baseball game and there's there's cheering going on and there's noise and you don't, you don't hear a little girl's yell or scream 75 yards away because everybody next to you is yelling and screaming. It's just one of those tricky things where I, I keep going back to what the sheriff has said time and time again in this case, that it's such a simple case, and that's what has made it such a difficult case to investigate. She's there one minute, and then she's not there. Right. And we don't know what information we can trust from some of the witnesses, especially when it's compared to these other abductions. The one one of those abductions that may have contributed to the description of this man. This is not verified by police. I couldn't find a statement them confirming this, but what the statement was from the article that I was reading was that they were putting forth the idea that one of those abductions was actually a custody dispute. Right. And that later that's what was, that's what prompted police to change the composite sketch of what they later released saying this is from actual witnesses from the abduction or from that night at the ballpark, because then they later find out, Oh, the man that tried to take one of these little girls in one of these situations, it was a custody dispute. That's why I wonder if the, the vehicle description that is so detailed, if it may have come from someone that knew that man or saw that vehicle up close and personal or saw it for a longer period of time rather than what these children at the ballpark saw. Yeah. It, it, it bothers me. Like, like I said, um, but if the FBI is look, they have the best profilers. They've done profiles on individuals where they, they say some of the craziest stuff, you know, like we think that the perpetrator's favorite color is orange, you know, or he might have a disfigurement or a speech impediment or, He's, you know, th- there's all kinds of things that are interesting. The- yeah, but th- but when they're correct, and, and it's like this very tiny detail of how the hell did they know that? How the hell could they profile for that detail? Mm-hmm. And so for them to say, well, look, we got no shoes, we got no shirt, we're, we're, we're thinking this guy is a local guy. Again, I don't know the ballpark that well. So the ballpark, from my understanding, is now a parking lot. I was trying to look up the ballpark, even if I couldn't find pictures from '95. If I could find something closer right. to today, to I get could a, not find anything. Yeah, to get an idea of the layout and the size. I really wanted to know the size of it and what was in the immediate area because some of the ball fields that we played at growing up, some of them were very small, containing one, one, yeah, uh, one diamond, one diamond, yeah. or maybe two. This Others contain twelve this is how you or fifteen. Know. He didn't play a lot of baseball. I was. You know, I kept wanting to call uh, it a field. <laughs> court it was a court. It was a court. I was no. more of a field guy. No, because yeah, because some places, you know, when traveling for music and stuff like that, I'd see these one diamond in the middle of town, and it, there was just a couple parking spots around it. it it's, it's almost like people just parked at their houses and walked to the diamond, and then there's a lot of other places that have multiple diamonds. And so you just wonder, again, because we don't have that information on hand, uh, it's hard to get a perspective. But again, I I just don't see, look, I'm no FBI profiler. Most of the time, I'm a giant idiot. But I just don't see that it's that hard for people to think if this individual stopped and parked there to stay, I'm with you with on a that. camper. That makes sense. That why wouldn't they just throw on some sandals and you know, I just can't I just woke up from a nap and I have no shirt on and I got this hairy man chest and I'm gonna show it off. The wanna be peacocking. The wannabe profiler in me tells me that this ball 
field, the ballpark, whatever you want to call it, is probably on the smaller scale. Because right. if the games did, in fact, get pushed back to the point of two and a half hours to three hours delay, right? if they had multiple diamonds, you could easily move those games to an open diamond. Right. You see what I mean? Rather than yeah, yeah, rather yeah. than just making everybody well, stuck a, there for right, an extra well, three hours. But hold on. I played a lot of softball tournaments, and sometimes what happens, it's somebody that got into the loser bracket, and they just kept winning. And then it became a situation where it's like, well, we think that this team, you know, you have to lose two games and you're out. Well, the team with one loss ends up destroying a bunch of teams, getting and facing a team that only has, that has no losses. And they have to beat them twice in a row. So that might be a reason why somebody got pushed back so far. But I also question how, again, I, I people from this town will know and, and hopefully we can get some conversation on the blog about these diamonds and, and how many were, were they and how how were they connected to the rest of the town and were they buy a lot of residencies. I'd like to know that because I think that could give us a, a better uh, outlook on this case. The other thing, too, that you have to question is the profilers or the FBI agents that worked this case early on they, unlike us, would know exactly what the children said their conversation was with this man, the right. information that they've been holding on to. Yeah, because, again, it, there could be something very simple in that conversation of, oh, yeah, that's that's my truck. Or, well, the profilers are the I ones live. saying that they think it's unlikely. Now, I question a lot of this stuff because we don't have actual agents' names to apply and to attach to these statements of we believe that the man that spoke to the children, the shirtless man, is an unlikely suspect. Mm -hmm. But one thing that comes out in some of these articles, Captain, is that this was leaked. This is not confirmed. But it was that the man came up to the children and yelled at them because they were breaking bottles. And he was concerned about broken glass in the area and in the parking lot. Right. If, in fact, this is true, that's where you have the FBI agents going, okay, he, he has a reason. He has a purpose to speak to these children because of their actions rather than something he's trying to do. Therefore, we don't think he is a likely suspect. There's a chance that the man just doesn't recall speaking to children that night or spoke to many children that night. What I what I do call into question is why has this man not come forward? Just like you pointed out earlier with the very detailed description of that truck, if you saw that description of that truck or heard it immediately and that's your truck, you know that's your truck. You it's yeah. not <laughs> there's no question about it, right? Yeah, well no and the, the camper also somewhat makes some sense as far as like travel baseball goes is because you'd be playing this tournament and you would you know, one of my neighbors has a big camper and they got the big camper to start going to their grandkids sporting events. And they just thought, what a great way to go. And it will give the family a, a place that they could hang out in during, uh, during their off times. So it makes sense for a lot of the people that were possibly at the ball diamond that night to have something like that. There is a statement that I found, Captain, that does offer some hope for this investigation, and that comes from Chief Russell White. He is the Alma PD police chief back in 2015. He acknowledged that they have a, quote, lead suspect in the case, but not enough evidence to make an arrest. Right. Which that is very hopeful. And, and again, but maybe we can create some kind of conversation, some dialogue as far as the blog goes, go to truecrimegarage.com. If you have any information about this case, even if you think it's very small, put it out there. There's a lot of intelligent people that visit the blog and, and put out information and some theories. Not, not, not that we always agree with them, uh, but we, I like actually posting the ones that I don't agree with because I think it's a different viewpoint out there. Like I said, I think we can create some dialogue. Hopefully that helps maybe even create a new lead or a new angle that they could go after this suspect with. After receiving more and more invitations to speak at schools and churches, Colleen Nick 
formed the Morgan Nick Foundation, which is a nonprofit headquartered in Alma. Colleen said in an interview, quote, we still don't know where she is or what happened to her. And we absolutely intend to know that our message to Morgan, if she ever hears or sees or reads anything about her own case, is that we are coming for you and we are coming with an army of people who have been fighting for you. The Morgan Nick Foundation offers support to families of the missing and acts as a liaison with police and the media. Members strive to educate teachers, students, and communities about safety skills and preventative measures they can take to ward off possible kidnappers. The foundation encourages legislation that protects the rights of children and enhances law enforcement's ability to find the missing and bring them home. All right, it's so good to be back in 2020. It's the year of the garage. For all of our old episodes, check us out on the Stitcher app and also check out our bonus episodes called Off the Record on Stitcher Premium. Until next week, be good, be kind, and don't let it.